Okay, welcome to Space Biology, teaching your students how to live and work in space. Um, with our NASA resources, we focus a lot on space science and on earth science, um, physical sciences, but we don't always touch on biology and it's such a crucial component to NASA's missions. Um, that it's really, it makes me sad that that's an oversight or a misconception that NASA doesn't do biology. So what I'm going to share with you today are some activities that are good for doing um, just around the house. They don't require lab equipment or anything like that, that relate to biology as it pertains to NASA and NASA's missions. So hopefully you'll find something um, that you can work on with your students. This is good for anywhere from um, like upper elementary through high school. Uh, life science classes. Okay, our agenda for today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the ERC. I'm going to talk about the 5E model, which is kind of a pedagogical framework um, that I've, I've leaned on for designing this. And then we've got five modules um, for space biology. I'll talk a little bit at the end about our STEM on station kit um, and how it relates to the content in here because there's a lot of overlap. Um, hopefully you'll gain some knowledge about how crucial an understanding of biology is to long-term space flight and immediately be able to implement some activities with students via distance learning. So I am privileged to work at the NASA Ivy and VERC in Fairmont. Um, our office performs the independent verification and validation for software on all NASA missions, which basically means they take the code and they look at it to make sure it's doing the job that it's supposed to and that it's going to function properly. Um, we do summer camps, internships, robotics, training, and a big part of our, what I'm involved in is our equipment loan program. We train teachers all over the state of West Virginia. And when I say teachers, I mean broadly educators, librarians, homeschool parents, anyone who's interacting with kids um, and wants to give them some fun science education. We have about 30 different kits um, and they vary from various robotics systems to a portable planetarium, to a hydroponic system, and there's just a lot of different things that we do. Um, that's on pause right now while we are not able to access our building or travel. Um, so we're doing webinars to kind of give you some, some interesting things that you can talk about and do with your students during this, this time of not really being able to have a traditional educational um, system the way that we're used to. So this is our team. We are just a fantastic group and everyone has just been doing such a great job as we've made this transition from really in-person stuff to really online. We're currently working on how to do our summer camps, whether we'll be able to do those in small groups and still have students work hands-on with robotics, whether we're gonna have to send out uh, robots to kids to work with, or whether we're gonna have to go all digital with something like CRCC or Scratch and have an entirely virtual camp. So that's, our, that's one of our focuses right now. So the 5E instructional model, um, I honestly don't know who came up with this, but it comes out of the learning cycle, if that's something that you're familiar with. And the idea with the learning cycle is, is you front load the hands-on stuff, and then you explain what's going on, and then you go back and allow students to have more hands-on and elaborate on. 5e just breaks it up into a few more parts but it's that same idea you start with engage which is just something to capture your students attention it could be a discrepant event it could be a short demonstration that makes them go what's happening it could be a video it could be any anything that's going to capture their imagination and make them start questioning and wondering about the content that you want to teach the next step is explore and that's usually a hands-on experience something that they can do. After that is when you move on to your explain, which can be your traditional lecture, it could be students doing guided research, it could be anything where they're gaining content knowledge. And then elaborate is ideally um, individual or group projects that they sort of self-select based on interest. The fifth E is evaluate, and that happens throughout the entire process. It's not just the like final exam. It's also our informal um, observations and evaluations that we're making as learning is going on. The reason why I love this model is because it levels the playing field for students. By giving them that hands-on experience and explore before we move into explain, it allows our students who lack background information, who lack rich experiences, um, who haven't been to science museums, who don't watch Bill Nye the Science Guy videos for fun on their free time, it gives them something 
to make the lecture more meaningful, to make the explanation stick, to give them something that they can relate to that they've actually been a part of and done. And so it's a really, it, I find it to be really powerful, particularly when we've got students in our classrooms with a wide variety of background experiences and privilege. Um, and then I, the reason that it's a cycle like this is that in a perfect world, in their elaborate part, they'll come across something new that they want to learn more about. That'll be the engage piece. And then they just keep going with this. In reality, we can't usually do that um, seamlessly in the classroom because we all kind of have to cover one topic and then the next. But ideally, they're gaining something in elaborate that starts them off on this cycle again. Okay, so true to that form, we're gonna start with a little explore activity. In the chat, I'm going to post the link to a survey. So if you can open up the chat and go there, this is uh, what's in your backpack is the name of this. And I didn't come up with this, but basically you are imagining that you are going on a mission to Mars and you get to take 10 things with you. Um, you usually would do this in class in small groups, so they would have to argue and discuss about things, ask each other questions. Unfortunately, I can't do that very well right now. Um, you're welcome to argue and discuss in the chat for sure. But for this modified digital version, I'm just asking you to pick five of the things on the list that you think would be the most helpful on our mission to Mars. So go ahead and navigate over there. If you're not sure where the chat is, excuse me, if you kind of mouse down along the bottom of your screen, there should be three dots that say more. If you click on those, um, it'll open up the chat for you. And you can see that link there. So take a moment to navigate over there and then um, go ahead and make your choices. It's not anything you need to worry about too much. I'm just kind of giving you an idea of this activity. definitely showing this to you during the um while you're still deciding could be influencing some people's choices um which is something to think about if this is something you try to do uh distance learning with your students um what happens next is i've got a bunch of anomaly cards and as anomalies happen you have to see if you've got one of the items that will solve that anomaly so it could be that someone's having a seizure it could be someone's having back pain it could be that someone's bored so each of those anomalies has to be resolved with something that you brought with you um, for you to successfully continue on your mission, okay? Um, I also am in the process of making a scratch version of this where students can play a game, basically. It is real broken right now, so don't it's a work in progress. That was really loud. Okay, so it's the same thing where you've got those 20 items. It lets you pick 10 of them. Okay. And then um, randomly in the course of their space mission, an anomaly will pop up. And then if you have something that can solve that, you can drop it on there and it'll let you go on with your mission. So it's not as developed as I would like it to be right now, but it's something that I'm working on. And I guess we're not getting an anomaly this time in the timer. Oh no. There we go. Okay, so a toothache can only be solved with a dental kit, right? So if I drop that on there, that's a good job. and then we can go on with our mission. Okay, so that's the that's the basic idea of that. There, um, it's not finished yet, but we'll get there. 
So the other part of this is once students have made their 10 choices, you have the option of also telling them, okay, now there's a weight limit and here are the weights of the various things. So you have to cut down your 10 items to fewer than that to make sure that you fit the weight requirement because anything that we send to space um, requires so much fuel to get it there that it is extremely expensive to send anything that is high weight. I was just at another training yesterday and they said that a bottle of water, just a plastic like half liter bottle of water, takes $20,000 worth of fuel to get in the space. So cutting down on weight is a huge part of it and that's something that you can definitely extend there. In that same space biology folder that I shared with you, there are handouts for these. So this can be something that you use in person if you would like to, um, where they can rank their top 10 and then you also have the mass and then you tell them what the mass has to be, the ideal mass for the mission. Um, and then these are the anomaly cards. And you can just give these to your students um, and see if they have the things to get by there. Excuse me. Um, and you can leave this open for some reasoning for them. Like one of the options on the list is an iPad with movies. You probably also have some pictures of your family that you could store on there. So maybe the iPad can solve homesickness as well. So you can leave it open to your students to have those conversations and argue for why this thing should be allowed to solve that. Um, and so that is our, that is our entry activity. Good, good deal. Okay, and that's kind of just to get us thinking about what we're going to be learning about today. Um, and that would be my engage, would be filling out that worksheet. The explorer would be using the anomaly cards. How would, um, the link, Amber, if you don't have it in your chat, I'll repost it for you. Okay, so that is the link to the Google folder. I also will send this out in the email after the workshop. Um, that'll probably come out early this afternoon. And um, I'll, I'll include the links, all of the links that I have in here as well. So don't, if you miss something in the chat, don't worry, I'll make sure that you get it um, in the email afterwards. And so um, we're gonna watch part of a video that talks about some of the challenges of going to Mars. And I'm gonna view that as the explain part of this first initial lesson. We're not gonna watch the whole thing because it's kind of long, but it's really good. Um, and then for elaborate, you could have your students do a skit on a spaceship and talk about the different medical things or um, psychological things that are happening. You could choose one of the topics in the video and do a presentation on it. So it just depends like how creative you wanna get. With elaborate, I've put a few options in for these, but there are limitless things you could do. And taking student suggestions is a really good idea too. Okay, I think I have it so that it'll share video okay. If not, just let me know and we can skip the video parts later on. Um, and you can go back and watch those on your own if it's obnoxious to watch it through my screen. But let's give it a try. When I was up there for a year, I think I felt like at some point I had lived my whole life up there. That was former NASA astronaut Scott Kelly, who returned to Earth in March after spending 340 days on the International Space Station. His year in space is a stepping stone for future missions to Mars and deep space, because it's helping NASA understand how long-term spaceflight affects the human body. But how does long-term spaceflight affect the mind? What about the psychological challenges of being in space? In short, what will it take mentally to get to Mars? A mission to the Red Planet will last two to three years. That means that for two to three years, astronauts will live in microgravity, isolated and far away from home. They won't have many comforts. They won't be able to just step outside and breathe some fresh air, or pick up the phone and call their loved ones. And they'll be living in a high-risk environment, where they might die if anything goes wrong. Such a stressful situation is likely to have psychological implications. Microgravity can add to the stresses as well, and that can produce some stress and strain uh, maneuvering around. And That's Nick Canas, a space psychiatrist at the University of California, San Francisco. Also, the way people look in microgravity, sometimes they look puffy and sometimes kind of angry, and so it can be um, a stressful issue as well. One of the main reasons for Scott Kelly's year on the space station was to understand how his body change and adapting in space. So on the space station while I was there, there was 400 different experiments and of those a lot were life science experiments. You know most of those are related to understanding 
our physiology so we can go you know, further into the solar system and to Mars someday. We already know some of the physical problems astronauts face. People who spend time in space experience bone loss. Microgravity causes muscles to shrink, making astronauts weaker and less coordinated. And astronauts also eat less than they should. And it's key that they get the right nutrients to stay healthy. But there's a lot we still don't know about the effects of a long space mission on the human mind. For now, we know that astronauts... What will it take mentally? <laughs> I'm going to stop it there, but this is a really good video and it's definitely something that I would watch with my students if I was still in the classroom. Um, there's some really interesting stuff in there and it, it really relates how NASA's missions are, our understanding of biology is incomplete when it comes to microgravity. And so that's kind of the springboard for this whole sort of overview lesson. Some of the health concerns of a mission to Mars is like she said, it's going to take two to three years to get there and back um, at a minimum. Like, and this is perfect window of launch from um, Earth to Mars. It would be a minimum of 440 days. The next low energy window like that is in 2033. And so because Mars and Earth, they're orbiting in the same direction, but not at the same speeds, right? So sometimes they're much farther apart from each other than close together and so just the orbital trajectories of getting something to launch from earth and then end up where mars is is like beyond my abilities but the idea that sometimes we're going to have a shorter trip to get to mars and sometimes it will be so long that we could not possibly launch and get there with like um realistically okay and there's also no way to come back early we have astronauts up on the international space station and they could get off of there and back to Earth in a, in a crucial emergency within three hours. Um, ideally, it would take more like a day if there was someone having a medical emergency and we wanted to make sure that they landed somewhere hospitable. But there are some places on Earth that are farther away from hospitals than that. So our astronauts in space are actually pretty close to medical care if some sort of emergency arose. Mars, that's not going to be the case. There's no way to come back early from a trip to Mars because of those calculations with the orbits moving and such. So that, in addition to the obvious medical issues related to that, brings a lot of psychological stress. Um, micrometeoroids on the way to Mars at any point could tear through the ship. Um, these are just very small pieces of debris that are moving extremely quickly and could just completely ruin the mission at any moment and it's not something that we could predict. I can't imagine living in that in that kind of a situation. Failure of any system could could cause the astronauts to lose their lives. Um, additionally, medicines degrade faster in space probably because of the increased radiation. If we do send astronauts to Mars, there will be a two-week window when there's absolutely no communication with Earth because Earth will be on one side of the sun and Mars will be on the other and will not have any way, excuse me, to get messages from one to the other. On top of that, the best case scenario for the time delay between messages sent from Earth to Mars or vice versa is 20 minutes. Sometimes it can be almost double that, again, because of those positions in orbit. Uh, microgravity causes a lot of effects on the body, which we're gonna talk about as does radiation, which is a huge concern for any mission to Mars. Uh, Mars's atmosphere is less than 1% of Earth's, which means that, and also Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. So here on Earth, those are two reasons why we are really protected from radiation um, that are not going to be uh, available on Mars. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that study, absolutely. Okay. Um, Micrometeoroids here has a link. There's an activity you can do with a potato um, astronaut that, and micrometeorites, if that's something that you would think would be interesting to do with your students. Um, this particular trajectory to Mars takes six months and that's a very best case scenario kind of thing. Uh, there are some Mars to stay plans. Those are not um, come up with by NASA at all. NASA's always been of the opinion that we send our astronauts out and we bring them home safely. 
Um, so those, if you hear about any of those, like a colony where we're launching people to Mars and they're going to live there for the rest of their lives, those are private companies that are discussing that. That's not a NASA plan. So the next activity is Mars Emergency Room. So knowing that there are all of these concerns, knowing that they're not gonna have access to a hospital, what kind of medical equipment do you think that you would wanna have on Mars? And this is a really simple intro activity. Um, oh, did I open that one? No, I didn't even open that video up. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a pass on that one. Um, but it's good to, um, a medical emergency could occur at any time, both on the journey to Mars, on the Martian surface, or on the journey back from Mars. So what kind of medical equipment do you think that you would want or need? Um, so to do this, I would probably do that engage activity first, um, and then I might do explain, like what I just did talking about the um, different risks. And then I would have students find stuff around the house that they could turn into uh, some sort of equipment, whether it's an MRI or uh, some sort of scanning uh, device or um, whatever, whatever they think would be useful on Mars, whatever they would want if they were a Martian astronaut, just in case something went wrong. Um, you can assign random values to it, so you would give them a budget, excuse me, and then for whatever objects they can find in their house, have them roll a dice or something to have that be a certain value. And then they have to build and present what they build. And as a class, you can sort of have like, okay, here are all the different devices that we have in our emergency room. Which is just, again, a little fun thing to kind of get us moving in this direction. One of the most um, crucial things would probably be a 3D printer. Because then you can make different things that maybe you didn't think you needed or you realize that, okay, we can't bring 85 different pieces of equipment, but if I bring a 3D printer, we're probably not gonna need all 85 pieces of those equipment. Maybe we'll only need 10, and we can 3D print those 10 as things come up. Um, so that would be something to maybe research and include. I know that we've talked a lot about 3D printers being useful during the COVID crisis, and so the same would be true on a mission to Mars. All right, the next thing we're gonna talk about is microgravity. So first I wanna say microgravity, the reason I'm using that word um, is that the astronauts on the spacecraft or on the International Space Station are not experiencing zero gravity. Um, they are close enough to the Earth that the amount of gravity they'd be feeling is like 90, 95% of what we feel here on the surface they're not floating because they're far away from the Earth's gravity. They're floating because the International Space Station is traveling fast enough that it is falling around the Earth. Okay, so it's kind of a, like a weird distinction, but it's also one if you don't bring up students get misconceptions about. So if you talk to someone and they're saying, okay, well, the, the astronauts on the International Space Station don't feel gravity, and then you say, yeah, okay, but the Earth uh, has the moon around it due to gravity, and the moon's a lot farther away than the astronauts are, so how can the Earth be pulling on the moon but not be pulling on the astronauts, right? So talking to our students about how um, the difference between microgravity and zero gravity, we talk about the astronauts on the International Space Station experiencing microgravity because they're still within the Earth's pull, but they are basically experiencing the equivalent of zero gravity. And the human body evolved in a 1G environment. Um, we're, we have adapted to experiencing the amount of gravity we have on Earth's surface. Not being within that gravity can cause a lot of problems for the human body. Um, immediately, once they get up there, astronauts get stuffed up. They feel like they have a head cold for the whole time they're up there because the way our sinuses work, they use gravity to drain them down. Like how when you get out of bed in the morning, sometimes you feel a little stuffy and then you stand up and after a while it goes away. Imagine not, not being able to stand up and have that feeling go away for a few months. Um, in, in response to that, uh, a lot of the space food that's sent up has to be really spicy because as, as their sinuses are congested, they can't taste or smell food as well. It's an increased risk of kidney stones, 
Um, there's more blood clot problems and circulation problems. Uh, increased exposure to ionizing radiation can cause long-term damage that never goes back. And loss of bone density and eyesight problems are what we're going to talk about next. You know, Connie, I'm not sure if we've ever had an astronaut with epilepsy. I would guess not, but I don't, I don't know well enough to say whether that's the case or not. That is an interesting question, though, and I imagine it's one that students would have. Okay, so for eyes in space, um, some interesting things happen to the human eye in space. And to get us started, we're going to watch a really short video. I'm going to tell you about one of the world's largest problems and how it can be solved. I'd like to start with a little experiment. Could you put your hand up if you wear glasses or contact lenses or you've had laser refractive surgery? Now, unfortunately, there are too many of you for me to do the statistics properly, <laughs> but it looks like I'm guessing that it'll be about 60% of the room because that's roughly the fraction uh, of a developed world population that have some sort of vision correction. The World Health Organization estimates, well, they make various estimates of the number of people that need glasses. Their lowest estimate is 150 million people. They also have an estimate of around a billion. But in fact, I would argue that we've just done an experiment here and now which shows us that the global need for corrective eyewear is around half of any population. And the problem of poor vision is actually not just a health problem, it's also an educational problem, and it's an economic problem, and it's a quality of life problem. Glasses are not very expensive, they're quite plentiful. The problem is that there aren't enough eye care professionals in the world to use the model of the delivery of corrective eyewear that we have in the developed world. There are just way too few eye care professionals. So this little slide here shows you an optometrist and the little blue person represents about 10,000 people and that's the ratio in the UK. This is the ratio of optometrists to people in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, there are some countries in sub-Saharan Africa where there's one optometrist for eight million of the population. How do you do this? How do you solve this problem? I came up with a solution to this problem, and I came up with a solution based on adaptive optics for this, and the idea is you make eyeglasses and you adjust them yourself, and that solves the problem. What I want to do is to show you that one can make a pair of glasses, and I shall just, I shall just show you how you make a pair of glasses. I shall pop the, this in my pocket. Uh, I'm short-sighted. I look at the signs at the end, I can hardly see them. So, okay, I can now see that man running out there, and I can see that guy running out there, okay? I've now made prescription eyewear to my prescription. Um, next step. How cool is that? Okay, so that's our, that's our engage, right? Hopefully you're engaged now and wondering how this works and, and what happens and whatnot. So the shape of our eye is <laughs> good. The shape of our eye is what determines how well we can see, whether we're nearsighted or farsighted. Um, this is a really small picture, so I'm just going to expand it a little bit. And this is from the Optics of the Human Eye article in there. So if you're nearsighted like I am, um, the focal length of your eye puts the correct image in front of your retina, which means that you're seeing everything fuzzy and out of focus. With farsightedness, it's the opposite problem. The eye is squished in the opposite direction and the focal point is behind your retina, so somewhere inside of your head. Um, and so glasses, corrective lenses, change the focus so that your, the, the correct image is ending up right on your retina itself. 
okay? So that's the point of using glasses. Those ad specs in that video, I love that they don't say what the issue is in there, but they basically use water. Like those injector things is just water and that um, water in between the lenses will change the focal length. Um, and so you can make your own eyeglasses that way, which is pretty cool. So with the corrected vision, um, the shape of the lens is what determines where, whether it focuses it closer than it, it would have been normally or farther back, depending on what kind of vision you have. So in space, um, about a third of astronauts experience vision problems, and some of those don't fully resolve when they get back to Earth. Some astronauts go up with 20-20 vision and come back down needing glasses, like for the rest of their lives. Um, the explore activity I would have you do with this is a cool water sphere lens. Um, it's taking some sort of spherical uh, bowl or you know fishbowl vase or something, and then looking at how you can use that to refract the image. Um, if you don't have that, the low tech solution is to put a drop of water on your cell phone screen very carefully so you don't get it into the electronics, but just on the screen. And just one drop of water, you can see how that distorts the image, right? And so that idea of using lenses of various shapes to change focal points is something that you can definitely talk about from an um, astronaut point of view. Because the reason that astronauts have this um, issue is partially to do with water. And water has really high surface tension, right? It, um, it wants to be in a ball shape. And on Earth, the only thing keeping it from being sphered up all of the time is gravity. We don't have that in space. So the eye itself is mostly water, like 99% water. And it will change shape in the absence of gravity. Our body evolved in a 1G setting. When we send it to space, it is not adapted for that environment. So the eye will change shape. Um, another issue is that and this is the part that causes permanent damage in some astronauts. Um, like I said, with your sinuses draining, your cerebrospinal fluid also uh, is expecting to exist in a 1G environment. Excuse me. And so when there is a lack of gravity, it tends to pool up in the head, just like our sinuses do. And that pressure can increase on the optic nerve and cause permanent damage to it. The longer you're in space, the more likely you are to have some sort of vision problem. There's a great Newzella article about it. Um, and then I also have linked to this cool simulation that where if you have lenses and balloons, you can um, put a lens at the end of the balloon, put a flashlight through it, and then you can play around with the focal length. So if you have like an arrow or something drawn on the lens, you can squish it. But that's not something I'm expecting people to have at home. If you're wanting to look at a more physics application of that, FET has a great simulation where you can play around with lenses. Um, if you're wanting to go to a biology focus for Elaborate, one of your options is to look at how microgravity affects a particular system, like taking the eye as a model and then looking at one of the other systems and how they interact. Okay, so that's, that's my eyes in space little module. So for bones in space, I think most of us have heard that um, astronauts going to space come back with less bone density. Um, this is definitely something that was seen in the twin study that was done. The first astronaut in that video we were talking about, Scott Kelly, spent a year in space, 340 consecutive days. Um, what they don't talk about in that video is that Scott uh, Kelly has an identical twin, Mark. Mark is also an astronaut. So this is like, this is heaven if you are a biological scientist wanting to study the effects of, um, the effects of microgravity on humans because twin studies are such a gold standard for what we're looking at. You've got two people with identical genetics. These men both went through astronaut training. They have very similar life experiences. So to have one that can be in space for a year and one that's going to be on the ground, and the reason Mark Kelly, um, was grounded, he retired early uh, because his wife, Representative Gabby Giffords, uh, she survived an assassination attempt and he wanted to be with her during her recovery. So he took an early retirement, which meant that he was on the ground while his brother was in space. And these poor men had so many blood samples drawn from them 
and had this huge longitudinal study that went on way after um, uh, Scott got back from space. And they found that after a year, 93% of Scott's genes were back to normal. Most of those changes uh, were epigenetic changes. They were changes in gene expression, not in the actual DNA. But those changes in how genes are expressed can profoundly affect um, different systems of the body. And the four issues that they found were DNA repair, which makes sense. Space is much more radiation uh, than here on Earth. Bone formation, which again makes sense immune system and longer telomeres. They found that um, Scott's telomeres became longer, which is interesting because telomeres we think have something to do with the whole aging process. If that's something that you think your students would be interested in, there's a little link to articles down there that are specifically about those two and the studies that we've done with them. So I don't think I wanna watch the bones video, but it's a good one. Um, our explore activity for this one is super fun. You take a little plastic bag, uh, fill it up with cereal or oyster crackers or something, and then you take a book on top of it and just smush it a little bit. Then you open it up, you count how many pieces are broken, you remove the broken pieces, and you put the rest of it back into the bag. Um, you can put less than that in and you just kind of estimate like, oh, this is about 80% full, this is about 50% full, and then you do the same thing. What your students should find is that when the bone or when the when the baggie is full, you're going to have a much less percentage that is broken than when the baggie is not full. And this is a model for how our bones work. Um, our bones are much less likely to have fractures and micro fractures and cracks and things like that when they are healthy and complete. Once we start to have that osteoporosis happen or like what astronauts experience, they're going to be much more prone to fracture because their bones aren't solid or aren't as solid. Um, and then for the explain, depending on your level, you could talk about um, what makes healthy bones or you could talk about the different types of cells that um, contribute to bone health. Okay, And this is something that is still not entirely understood. Um, but the behavior of osteoblasts and osteoclasts in orbit is much different than it is here on Earth, and they think that that has something to do with it. Um, so for elaborate, a couple ideas. You could design a piece of exercise equipment to be used in microgravity. There are tons of pieces of exercise equipment, excuse me, on the International Space Station because uh, our astronauts need to make sure that they are maintaining their bone density and uh, muscle mass as much as they can. I think they spend like three or four hours a day exercising. Um, you could also have them do more of a deep dive into Scott and Mark Kelly and talking about why those two are relevant to um, the rest of us here on Earth, right? Okay. All right, radiation shielding is the last one that we're gonna talk about. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of the explain first for you guys. So I apologize for the abrupt shift. Is that really what I want to do? Nah, let's do it in order. Let's watch the engage video. Okay, it's August 1972, and Ian Richardson, a future NASA scientist, is watching TV when the BBC announces the interference is caused by solar activity. He didn't know it then, but the sun had just erupted in one of the most powerful solar events ever recorded. There was no threat to humans because Earth's magnetic field deflects much of the sun's radiation. But the explosions were so powerful that intense radiation disrupted TV signals and caused radio blackouts. So what if you were outside Earth's magnetic field? On the moon and beyond, astronauts face the risk of extreme radiation exposure. Luckily, the intense radiation in 1972 occurred right between the Apollo 16 and 17 missions when no astronauts were in their path. As NASA plans missions to go back to the moon and then onto Mars, predicting the sun's activity to protect astronauts from space radiation is one of our biggest priorities. One of the biggest unknown factors about going to space is the radiation hazard from the sun. This is Ian today, studying the effects of the sun, also known as the field of heliophysics. The sun is always emitting radiation, like the light we see, 
but uh, certain energetic particles like from the August 1972 events can be far more harmful. To be able to forecast solar energetic particles, we need to know how the sun energizes them. The sun is made up of electrically charged particles called plasma. As this plasma moves, it builds up energy inside its massive magnetic field. This energy is usually released in two types of explosions. Flares are intense flashes of light. Coronal mass ejections are giant eruptions of solar material. These solar eruptions send shock waves across the solar system, accelerating particles as they go. These are solar energetic particles, or SEPs. They consist mainly of protons and possess a lot of energy that can affect satellite measurements and humans. SEPs can bombard you with a lot of radiation in a short period of time. They can penetrate your skin, damage your DNA, and increase your chances of getting cancer and radiation sickness. But they don't occur with every solar eruption. Only a small number of flares and coronal mass ejections create SEPs. So we're trying to predict when SEPs form and how they travel through space. At NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, the Community Coordinated Modeling Center, or CCMC, is dedicated to testing prediction models. Working with global partners, they use data from NASA satellites at different vantage points and models to figure out how solar explosions behave, including how shockwaves energize SEPs. And as we get better at predicting, we get more time to prepare. Preparation for an SEP event, of which you may know that is already coming and perhaps a magnitude as well, the technique that you would want to use is to put as much mass between you and the source. On the surface of the Moon or Mars, astronauts can go underground or build shelter with local materials. But in transit, astronauts can only be protected with what's on the spacecraft. Which means that you might have elements on a spacecraft that have multiple purposes. NASA space radiation specialists are testing different ways to do this. One strategy they tested on the Orion spacecraft involves crew members barricading themselves with as much mass as possible in the center of the spacecraft. Other possible techniques in development include vests that add mass and electrically charged surfaces that deflect particles. In terms of radiation protection and radiation mitigation, the factor of time is extraordinarily important. The sun has a natural 11-year cycle that transitions through low and high activity, which is indicated by the number of sunspots on the surface. More sunspots mean more eruptions, resulting in a higher risk for SEPs. But during this increased solar activity, the sun's magnetic field strengthens, enhancing its shield against another important source of radiation, galactic cosmic rays. These are charged particles traveling at nearly the speed of light that are thought to come from supernova explosions from within our galaxy and possibly further out in the universe. If solar energetic particles are intense sporadic storms, then galactic cosmic rays are a constant drizzle. Galactic cosmic rays are more sparse, but also much more energetic. They include heavier elements that can penetrate through vast amounts of materials. Understanding the rate of galactic cosmic rays all right, I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna pause it there, um, but you can get a sense of how complex these decisions are about when we should launch versus when we shouldn't. Um, there's definitely pros and cons to each of the various options. Whether you're launching at solar minimum or solar maximum is going to have a dramatic effect on what hazards um, our astronauts will encounter. Okay, so that would be the engage for the radiation part. Um, for the explore, if you're having a physics focus, um, if you have access to a black light and UV beads, you can design some sort of UV shielding, right? And UV beads, those are those like pony bead type things, but they're sensitive to UV light. So they look, um, they look just kind of whitish inside. And then if you take them outside, they're an extremely bright, um, like fluorescent colors, they change in the presence of UV light. So if you have the UV beads, you could also just take them outside. Um, or you could just use, try to develop a shield that um, blocks visible light, okay? Because both of those are part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, if you wanna get more advanced, there's a cool thing you can do with yeast um, and shielding it from radiation that I've got a link to there. If you have a more biology focus, you could have students build a model of DNA and de demonstrate the different types of, um, 
effects caused by radiations, whether it's a single or a double breakage or a substitution. So I'm just gonna go to that PDF for a second there. The model they have here you do with toothpicks and candy. Um, and so you're building the, the double helix um, and then you're not helixing it though, it's just flat. And then you um, do a double or a single strand break and think about how easy that would be for your cell to repair and how permanent that damage might be for it. And so there's a, there's a whole activity there as well. Um, if you, there's a great ebook that NASA has about space radiation that you could follow up on with Explain. If I were doing that, I would probably do it as a jigsaw with my students where each student or each small group would get a section, excuse me, that they were responsible for teaching the rest of the class about. Um, In-person jigsaws usually like, look like, okay, here's a small group that gets together and becomes experts on this one part of the text. And then one expert from each group forms new groups so that there's groups that have an expert from all of the groups in it and they take turns teaching each other. Um, online, a jigsaw might look like, okay, these groups get together and meet and talk about it and become experts in this one area. And then they have a different meeting or a different discussion board where they share what they've learned. Um, as an elaborate, you could uh, research and select a method of radiation shielding that you would employ for long-term space flight or spend some time looking at the XKCD radiation poster, which I'm gonna show you. So, the reason we put telescopes into space is because our atmosphere is really good at blocking certain parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we have optical telescopes here on Earth and in space. Hubble's our optical telescope in space. Um, and the reason that Hubble's better in space is because the atmosphere does distort some of the visible light that comes to us. And so you're not getting perfect images from um, the ground-based telescopes that we have that are in the optical um, spectrum. Uh, and then radio waves also come through. So like Green Bank here in West Virginia, uh, radio waves are able to penetrate our atmosphere. Um, microwaves and infrared are mostly not. We get some part of the uh, infrared spectrum, but our atmosphere absorbs a lot of that energy. And same with ultraviolet. Um, we get a little bit of the ultraviolet spectrum, but not the more high energy wavelengths than that. We don't have any threat from um, X-rays or gamma rays from outside of our solar system or from our sun uh, because those things are entirely absorbed by our atmosphere. That's not the case for astronauts though. The International Space Station is close enough that um, we're within the Earth's magnetic field, so some of those are deflected, but it is above the atmosphere, so we're not able to count on that to protect our astronauts um, from some of those wavelengths. And this, um, this graph really shows that. So the US annual average of radiation is right here. Um, six months on the International Space Station puts you up here. This is a great opportunity to talk about logarithmic scales and how even though these bars look relatively close together, this is over 10 times as much radiation um, compared to a year. So it would be double that amount for a year on the International Space Station like what uh, Scott Kelly had. Um, comparing that to Mars, it's 10 times again what uh, they experience on the ISS in six months. If you have a 180 day transit to Mars, 500 days on Mars and 180 transit back, that's a huge amount of radiation compared to um, what we would experience here uh, just being on Earth in this environment that we are well adapted to. Um, XKCD is a comic, it's a web comic, but he also does um, some really interesting infographics, and this is one of them. It is meticulously researched, excuse me, and again, it relies on a basically a logarithmic scale. So these first little blue dots um, are relatively small. Eating a banana does give you a certain amount of radiation. And that's because um, bananas are high in potassium, which is good, but potassium does have a radioactive isotope. And so when you're eating a banana, you are getting a small extra dose of radiation. Uh, it is much, much too small for it to be of anything to be a concern. The benefits of eating bananas certainly outweigh the costs, um, but it is, it's a measurable amount of radiation. Okay, and then all of the dots on this blue table it can fit into these three dots on this green chart to give you an idea for scale. 
and it goes up from there. And I will let you peruse that at your leisure, but I could definitely assign this to a group of students and say, okay, just look at this for a bit and tell me three things you think are interesting and three questions you have, and that could be an elaborate that maybe then sparks their interest in something else that is um, taking them beyond this. Okay, we're, we're getting close, we're wrapping up. Um, I'm gonna do a plug for our STEM on Station kit. Uh, it has four different components and STEM on Station really is our most biology focused kit. Uh, the microgravity one is less about biology and more about uh, the Toys in Space program, which is basically NASA sent um, various toys up to the International Space Station with astronauts and had them play with them because some toys work really well in microgravity and some toys don't work at all. And so it's a cool opportunity for our youngest learners to um, feel invested and excited about the research that's going on on the International Space Station. Most biology focused, we have a hydroponics kit called Plants in Space where you can sort of mirror some of the experiments that were going on on the International Space Station. And the astronaut anatomy kit is the one that's probably the best for biology teachers. We also have this cool one uh, with a robotic arm where you can, um, you start with having the students build cardboard um, arms. So they have like a few pieces of cardboard and some brads and some string and straws. And so they can like make joints and things like that that flex. Um, there's a robotic arm in there. There's a couple hydraulic arms. And so they have different ways to look at how um, joints move and how, what kind of range of motion that gives you. All right, there are a ton of other things that I would love to talk about. I basically picked the low hanging fruit for this uh, space biology um, presentation, but there are a ton of other great stuff out there. Space nutrition is fascinating and really interesting. Um, all of these have links on them. So this one's a little bit more appropriate for middle grades and high school. This one's more elementary focused. Uh, spiders in space is really cool. They sent some spiders up there and it took them a couple days before they started being able to spin webs that were any good for anything. So you can do a, a, you can do a model of that where you create a similar environment in your classroom and have your kids trap spiders and have them build a web and then compare it to the pictures from the International Space Station. Um, and there are a bunch of other resources here as well. For the three big activities, eyes in space, bones in space, and radiation shielding, I did tie it back to your science standards um, just so that you've got that for reference. But at this point, we are almost out of time. And so I'm going to open it up for any questions that you have, extra things you would like to see. I'm also going to post the link to our survey. Um, if you take our survey, we're really happy about that because it's something that's important for our reporting on our grant. And it will also email you a certificate that says that you attended this professional development. So that's it for the big overview. Um, let me know what questions you have and I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.